Good afternoon. My name is Colin Barr, and it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Keough Naughton Institute for Irish Studies and Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs, uh, who are sponsoring this, our third webinar in the series Transatlantic Conversations, Next Generation of the Peace Process a webinar series that we are pleased to co-host with the University of Liverpool, Liverpool's Institute of Irish Studies. And it is a particular pleasure uh, for me and an honor to be able to introduce and welcome our moderator for today's event, Claire Sutton, MLA. Now, Claire is the longest serving independent MLA in Northern Ireland. I believe in the Northern Ireland Assembly. I believe she's the, currently the only elected independent. In 2016, she was appointed Northern Ireland Justice Minister at the age of 29, which made her at the time one of the youngest government ministers in the world. She is, among other things, and this is some American parochialism for us today, she is an alumna of the Washington Ireland program, where she was there in 2012, 2010, I'm sorry, and then went on to become a manager and mentor in the program two years later in 2012. In addition to her keen interests in Northern Ireland's devolution, uh, and the good government of Northern Ireland, she is a powerful voice on the need for the specific legislation uh, to deal with domestic violence, a process that has come to fruition most recently in the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act of 2021, uh, a theme or a solution rather that she was instrumental in bringing uh, to the statute book. She's also involved in a variety of other issues derived from her time as Minister of Justice Minister and she will be guiding our conversation today. And with that, it's a really great pleasure and privilege to introduce Claire and to hand over to you, Claire. Uh, thank you, Colin, for your really kind introduction. And good evening to those joining us this side of the Atlantic and good afternoon to those uh, joining us stateside. It is my pleasure to moderate Transatlantic Conversation, which aims to frame better outcomes and understanding via reflective and evidence-based dialogue it asks for practical, flexible, and creative developments that respond positively to evolving realities. The building of the next generation of the peace process requires the implementation of ambitious ideas and confident resolutions backed by government um, uh, and backed by investment. To succeed, it will need academic, civic, business, and political choices that embed economic prosperity. Transatlantic conversation calls for a recognition for and development of the interdependent relationships between the United States, Ireland and the United Kingdom. Transatlantic conversation begins by exploring the perspectives of the UK and Irish governments. And tonight we hear from the UK perspective. At this point, I will remind the audience to ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And at this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Brandon Lewis. The Right Honourable Brandon Lewis, CBE, was appointed Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on the 13th of February 2020. He was previously Minister of State for Security and Deputy for the EU exit and No Deal preparation from the 24th of July 2019 to the 13th of February 2020. He was Minister Without Portfolio from January 2018 to July 2019, and Minister of State for Immigration from June 2017 to January 2018. Brandon was Parliamentary Under Secretary of State at the Department for Communities and Local Government from September 2012 until July 2014. He served as Minister for State for Housing and Planning at the Department for Communities and Local Government from July 2014 until July 2016. He was elected Conservative MP for Great Yarmouth in 2010, and he was made CBE for Political and Public Service in September 2019. The Secretary of State has overall responsibility for the Northern Ireland Office, advances UK government interests in Northern Ireland, and represents Northern Ireland interests in the Cabinet. He leads on political stability and relations with the Northern Ireland Executive, national security and counterterrorism implementation of the Stormont House and Fresh Start agreements, including legacy of the past, representing Northern Ireland in the cabinet on EU exit, including new economic opportunities and international interest in Northern Ireland, including relations with the Irish government. So I will ask uh, the Secretary of State if he would like to make some remarks around five to 10 minutes, and then we will have a, a discussion and di a dialogue thereafter. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. Thank you, and uh, like so, well, say thank you to everybody who's joining us, whatever time of day it is, 
uh, wherever you happen to be on either side of the, uh, the Atlantic. And look, thank you to all of you for uh, the invitation to join you today and talk to you today. And thank you, Claire, for um, mediating and, uh, and taking this on. I think um, I won't speak for too long, so I'd rather leave more time to deal and answer as many questions as possible. But I think it is just worth um, refreshing and, and outlining our view that um, the progress that Northern Ireland has made over the last, particularly the last 23 years, um, although it's genuine and it's uh, substantive and positive, uh, there are times where we can see it still is fragile at the very least around the edges as we have seen certainly in the last few months in Northern Ireland as, as a very stark reminder um, to all of us. Uh, we as a government are deeply invested, I'm personally very invested in ensuring that we do everything we can to allow Northern Ireland to really deliver on its full potential. And there are huge opportunities, I think, at the moment for Northern Ireland in terms not just of stability and prosperity, which I'll come back to, but also through reconciliation um, with its past as well, which is a focus for us um, in the period ahead. I think there has been a, a range of things over the last year with the difficulty that we have seen um, through COVID that all of us have faced. I think there's been a really clear reminder of the importance of devolution, the importance of having storm on up and running, where there's three-year impasse. Uh, the fortunately um, was resolved just before COVID came upon us. And actually, when you've got five parties power sharing, there's always going to be times where they disagree on things, on a range of things, that's to be expected. But through COVID, even though obviously there's been some difficult periods and some challenging things for them to work through, as a whole, I think the executive's done a very good job of coming together when it's so fresh and so new um, to work uh, with each other and with UK government for the interest of people in Northern Ireland. And I think we've seen the strength of things um, and, and what can be brought to the table with all of us working together, particularly through COVID, whether it's the, the furlough scheme that's protecting so many hundreds of thousands of jobs and people's incomes, the vaccine rollout, and actually Northern Ireland, for much of the vaccine rollout, has been leading the way even within the UK, where we've had a very successful rollout. Um, and the work that's been encouraging and looking at how we can further deliver investment in Northern Ireland, all of which is dependent on the uh, sovereign resources and support for, from the UK as a whole being able to work together. And, and actually, uh, an example of that is in our city and growth deals, which are very much looking at that prosperity agenda for Northern Ireland and financially, um, arguably, the biggest uh, city and growth deals we have in the UK are, in terms of support from the UK government, the ones in Northern Ireland. Um, obviously, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement continues to be not just a focus for us, but it is the cornerstone of Northern Ireland's governance um, and peace and prosperity. It's an achievement which uh, obviously the UK and the Irish government and those people in Northern Ireland should be rightly proud of, but also our friends in the US as well, because it's, uh, it's a centerpiece that brings us all together, that we all agree on in terms of um, something that has delivered and worked uh, for people in Northern Ireland. And this, the, the institutions established under it um, are hugely important, again, as we've seen very recently in Northern Ireland, uh, very clearly. And actually, just touching on a point that Claire, I, I think, made in her opening remarks, and, and, and I sort of referenced a moment ago, I think prosperity is crucial and delivering on improved prosperity. I think it's very clear that if you look around the world, actually, good pros prosperity and the aspiration, ambition, and expectation of prosperity and more opportunity goes pretty much hand in hand uh, with a peaceful process. It was, that was identified in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And it relies, having that prosperity absolutely relies <clears throat> on Northern Ireland continuing to not just be peaceful, you get that virtuous circle, but also having um, good access to both international markets and, of course, the, the structure and integrity of the whole of the United Kingdom. And I think there is a, what we see in the Northern Ireland protocol, which is very much on the agenda at the moment, and particularly today where we've had a court decision, um, the protocol itself is actually a very, very finely balanced uh, compromise. It protects and it seeks to protect very explicitly the Belfast Good Friday Agreement um, and the gains of the peace process. We have to remember in all of its dimensions, that's all three strands, Northern Ireland itself, obviously North South, but East West as well, and therefore prevents a hard border. We've also got to make sure uh, that it works for people East West as well as North South. And together, um, I think these principles of the protocol reflect the concerns and to try to deal with the concerns of the entire community of Northern Ireland, whatever their constitutional view 
may be. I mean, doing that can help play its important part in protecting the peace process. But I think it is also important that there is, a, to an extent, we also separate the two things. The protocol is not part of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and obviously neither is the, the other way around. But it is, and it explicitly seeks to deliver upon what was uh, agreed in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. But for us, that is absolutely paramount. We respect the EU's position about protecting the single market, but for us, the key focus is, for obvious reasons, I think rightly so, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And it's only if that really uh, finely balanced compromise is maintained across both communities, the whole community of Northern Ireland, can the protocol ensure that it has that continued support of both nationalists and unionists as it moves forward. And that's got to be the case in order for it to succeed and to live beyond um, in, in reality as well as through a consent mechanism in a few years' time. Um, and we agreed quite exceptional, difficult thing in the interest of peace. And if that's going to be sustainable, then it's got to be delivered in a pragmatic um, and a proportionate way. And the protocol itself, we have to remember, is very clear in its own words that it will uh, impact as little as possible in the everyday lives of communities. And it's only when the protocol is working well and smoothly in Northern Ireland that people across the assembly and across the wider community are going to be able to fully uh, endorse and support it. Um, because it is about more than trade. Trade is the thing that affects people if you're a consumer or a business in Northern Ireland. The outwork of the protocol, regardless of your constitutional view, will have an effect. It's why, although there's a lot of focus on how the unionist community feels, I've got to say the whole community and business community, regardless of whether they're nationalist or unionist, have issues with the protocol that they want to see resolved. Because it is, and, it, and, and through that, it is about more than just trade, because it does guarantee that the rights and the safeguards and the equality of people, all people um, in Northern Ireland, that in itself inherently means we've got to be. Um, reminding ourselves of the importance of that free political thought, freedom of expression, religion, um, and the ability to pursue democratically, obviously, national political aspirations, whatever uh, they may be. And the guarantee of these rights are integrally important to the communities across Northern Ireland and are an essential part, actually, of that Belfast um, Good Friday Agreement. And the protocol ensures those rights continue to be protected in full, demonstrating uh, in signing up to that, the UK government's commitment, I would argue, to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement um, itself. And that's why, however we proceed in the period ahead, we will always have as our key focus, our absolute overriding focus will be on stability, uh, prosperity, and protecting and safeguarding everything from the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The protocol itself is very clear in Article 1, I think it's paragraph 2 of Article 1, actually, that it respect the essential state functions and territorial uh, integrity of the UK. And for us, that is something we take very, very seriously um, to heart. We are going to continue to work hard and to work in good faith to find solutions. The news we've had today from the EU is positive news, but it is not a solution. It, I mean, it's a positive move from the EU, but we've got to work out the long-term solutions. Um, and that's why we're clear that we've got to be sure that we are always open to all the options that will allow us to deliver on our obligations to support peace, prosperity and stability in Northern Ireland. And anything we do and any position we take uh, will be done with those aims in mind because we've seen peace and prosperity in Northern Ireland. I think there's huge opportunities as we look forward, both through a smooth working protocol that gives Northern Ireland access, of course, to the UK market as an integral part of it, but also with that access to the EU market, because it's a unique place in the world for inward investment, but also because of what Northern Ireland has to offer, both in culture, creativity, advanced engineering and manufacturing, and cyber, where we genuinely have, I think I can argue anywhere in the world, a global leading um, expertise, so much so that uh, as we're talking to friends from across the Atlantic, your biggest insurance company, I think your biggest insurance company, basically have their software cyber base in Belfast. And there's good reason for that because we're the best in the world at doing that. And that's good for the UK, it's good for Northern Ireland, and I think that is one of those areas we can see grow and uh, deliver more prosperity in the future. Uh, but I'll pause there, Claire, and uh, over to you. Brilliant, thank you, Secretary of State. You seem really keen to talk about the Northern Ireland Protocol, so I think maybe we should start 
there. Um, you, you rightly say that the, the issues relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol are ultimately about trade. However, they are giving rise to identity issues, and we saw that with recent unrest in Northern Ireland over the last number of months. And I suppose from a perspective of a unionist perspective, and indeed speaking to those on the ground from loyalist and, and Protestant backgrounds, there is a suggestion if that if you are not able to have the same access to, to goods and products coming from GB into Northern Ireland within the same jurisdiction, then that is something somehow impacting on their ability to, to, to be within that current arrangement of, of within the union. So I suppose, what do you say to, to those communities on the ground who are feeling the very practical challenges of the Northern Ireland Protocol before these issues can get uh, worked out, if they can indeed get worked out? What do you say to those communities on the ground that they are very much still part of the United Kingdom jurisdiction? Yeah, that, that's a very fair question, Claire. Uh, there's, a, there's a few things in that. So first of all, um, those, those communities, citizens of Northern Ireland, um, are very much part of the United Kingdom. You know, that, that is, that's part of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. It works at two levels. You know, I would argue that Northern Ireland benefits from being in the UK. We spend more per capita in Northern Ireland than anywhere else in the UK. I've already explained about the, um, the city and growth deals. We've got substantial investment. Obviously, the furlough scheme, the, the increase of almost 20 billion um, to the Northern Ireland executive uh, in terms of uh, the block grant plus COVID Barnet consequential money last year because of the, the size and the, uh, the ability of the UK government treasury, the support we put in for connections between Northern Ireland and the mainland of Great Britain uh, through COVID. Uh, we've now secured with the New Deal money, if you like, take, let alone if you look at Peace Plus, and the 900 million uplift in the SR spending review process last year, the biggest period of investment in Northern Ireland by UK government for many decades. But it isn't just about Northern Ireland is better off in the UK because of what the UK brings to the table. The UK is better because of what Northern Ireland brings to the table. And as I said, whether it's culture, creative arts, or I don't just mean Game of Thrones, but you know, more widely what's happening in the film and TV industry to the massive employer. But also what it does in advanced engineering, manufacturing, cyber, green technology, um, and all of those areas make the UK stronger. And, it, and so I think it is important for us to be very clear that Northern Ireland is an integral part of the UK. And that's why for us it is important, and why I made the point of opening the mask, even the, the decision for you today is to be welcomed. It shows that pragmatism and flexibility is there. The EU have talked about that a lot in the last few months, but haven't really shown any. They've shown some today, but it's still only a temporary measure. We've got to get a long-term solution. We're very clear that uh, consumers in Northern Ireland need to be able to have access to the products they've had access to for many years. Uh, around the UK, and you'll find this in the USA, I know as well, even within states, let alone across states, different supermarkets will have different products in them to suit the local market. But that's about consumer choice and consumer demand, not regulatory restrictions. And we wouldn't dream of suggesting to the US that they can't ship USDA prime beef and steak out to Alaska and uh, Hawaii without it going through the Canadian customs controls. Um, and that's kind of what the EU are trying to do here. The point of the protocol was because we understand the EU's uh, focus on their single market. We respect that. We have our main focus on the Good Friday Agreement, obviously, but for them it's the single market. And therefore, we understand that products moving from GB to Northern Ireland that are going to go into the EU through the Republic of Ireland need to be dealt with, and that needs to be properly dealt with. And we understand that, we accept that, and we want to find pragmatic, flexible ways to do that. That's how we saw the protocol. The challenge at the moment is the protocol is dealing with all of these goods that are moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and staying to be consumed and used in Northern Ireland by UK citizens. That wasn't really the intent. You, you get a situation with supermarket chains we don't even have a store in the Republic of Ireland going for the same checks as those who are moving products to their stores in the Republic of Ireland. As you say, there are consumers who, if they go on Amazon, will find out this parcel they that can't get delivered by massively increased costs because of uh, the regulatory structures there. And that isn't sustainable because ultimately, because of the principle of consent, it's only sustainable if the people of Northern Ireland accept it. And it doesn't matter what somebody's constitutional view is. If you're a consumer or a business who can't access a product you've always accessed, you are being detrimentally affected. And we, we, we can't allow that to continue. We want to rectify that. We want to do that by working through practical, pragmatic, flexible solutions to the EU. There's a lot that technology can do. It couldn't even do a couple of years ago. Um, and we think there are solutions. We've put forward over a dozen papers in the last couple of months. We're still waiting for 
uh, really engaging with the EU on some of those, uh, well, all of those, uh, really. So we think there are ways through that, but then we've got to get those proper long-term solutions. And I would just say, touching your point there about identity, and I'm sort of giving a very long answer, but I just want to make sure I've covered everything off. I think we do need to understand, I think people beyond Northern Ireland and indeed beyond the UK sometimes do need to accept that there is an impact that, is, that affects the unionist community beyond the wider community of the whole of Northern Ireland in the sense of this point about identity. And what I saw and what I've seen on the ground is that when the EU went and triggered or attempted to trigger Article 16 on the Friday back in January, and I know that seems a long time ago now, but the, the, everything changed overnight. That, that created a sense of anger in the loyalist unionist community that hasn't recovered. And I know the EU regret doing it. I know they stopped it pretty quickly and they apologised, but they still did it. And it showed the unionist loyalist community that the EU was prepared effectively to create a north-south border, which it always said it wouldn't do. And that anger has continued and has, and has moved on because it's been added to as a cumulative effect with some of these technical areas not being resolved when the EU themselves at that time in January said, we will resolve to resolve, <laughs> we will try and resolve these things and work with speed. We're now six months from then, then and we've still got issues to resolve. So that frustration's only growing, and I absolutely understand that. But I think it is important to be clear that the outworkings in a practical sense is not just about the unionist community, it affects everybody. But yes, it has that extra added impact. And I would just lastly say, on a, a point you made in the opening of that question, Claire, the, um, obviously we did see violence, well, almost a couple of months ago now in Northern Ireland. I think we also need to be um, conscious of the fact that the, the reasoning and the creation of that violence was multifaceted. It was not just about protocol. Arguably, there were other things about outcomes from Bobby Story funeral, uh, views in the, in the loyalist community about how policing has been happening, some issues of success that the PSNI had had cracking down on drug gangs may well have played a part as well. There's a whole lot of things going on, including at the time that happened, young people in Northern Ireland have been in lockdown for a very long time. And if you remember, at that point, still didn't even have a roadmap for what was going to come out of it. So I think there was also, there was a whole you know, cauldron of things going on at that time. And every one of those things, I think, came together. So I think the violence in itself, there was a multifaceted set of things going on. But you're right, the tensions of the protocol, we're still seeing protests, substantially sized protests as well. And we do need to recognise that this is something that people want to see resolved, and we are determined and focused on doing that. We want to do that in partnership with the EU. OK, I suppose to build on that and just to take a few questions from the audience as well, your cabinet colleague, Lord Frost, today um, announced an extension of the child meets moving from GB to NI, and I think that's up until the 30th of September 2021. So it's an extension rather than a solution. And you talked about the need to find more permanent solutions in, in order to try and uh, get past the issues in relation to the protocol. Northern Ireland Retail Consortium again um, uh, commented on that saying that this is one of many issues that are facing businesses and I do appreciate your comments that this isn't a unionist nationalist issue, this is issues facing businesses right across Northern Ireland and I'm, I'm hearing this on a daily basis from my own constituents. Um, so how do we move forward? I know today is um, uh, an indication that there is willingness to try and work on these issues but how do we find longer term solutions so that you know, we're not just kicking the can down the road and that actually addressing the protocol is about finding solutions rather than extensions. Yes, yeah, so in essence, I, I, I know you asked that as a question, but I basically agree with the principle of the question. Um, the business community, I would also say, I just would take a moment to make a point. The business community in Northern Ireland have been absolutely superb. The business representation or organisations, the Northern Ireland retail consortium, as you say, but all across the FSB, IOD, the Chamber, the manufacturers, all of the organisations uh, have been really, really good and very, very engaged, both with us as UK government, I know they've engaged directly with the EU as well. Um, we've organised them to have some engagement, both with myself and Lord Frost, who leads on the negotiations with the UK government, and with Mal Shefkovic, including in the last couple of weeks. And we've done that consistently. And they've been really, really good at working and coming forward with very practical, pragmatic ways forward, which has fed into the work we've done. As I say, we've put forward now in the last month or so, about a dozen papers in the EU of ways to solve and, and long-term solutions. You're quite right. You can't keep kicking this down the road. And the decision today is good and positive, 
but there is a big but to it. Again, it is only moving things down the road a little bit. There needs to be a permanent solution. The permanent solution cannot be, as some in the EU seem to think, that we are basically waiting for all of the market diversion to happen so that all of the chilled meats are sourced on the island of Ireland. But there's two reasons for that. One is at a very basic UK integrity level. You know, people, if they want, as a Norfolk MP, if they want their sausage from Norfolk, I want people in Belfast to have to enjoy a Norfolk sausage, a Melton Mowbray pork pie, whatever it happens to be, as they always have done. That's what they do as citizens of the UK in the same way that you can anywhere else. And they're right to want that. But also, very expressly in the protocol, one of the things the protocol says that we should all be avoiding and ensuring doesn't happen is diversion of trade. And actually, as we saw Tony Connolly himself tweeting on behalf of the EU effectively last night, is that this will resolve itself by having diversion of trade, the very thing that would be a breach of the protocol. So we've got to get a long-term proper solution. We're clear that for us, that isn't about diversion of trade, which would breach the protocol agreement. It's actually about finding a pragmatic solution that means chill meats can continue to go to Northern Ireland to be enjoyed from GB, and given the EU confidence that they're not going to be, you know, we're not going to have sausages smuggled to um, Dublin, and that is going to threaten the sanctity of the single market, as fast as that may seem. But there are a wide range of other issues, as you rightly say. That's why we put in, as I say, more than a dozen papers now. It is important that you engage in that. And this is a two-way thing. I mean, we often in the UK get the traders being, you know, the ones who take action and do things. Well, we want to work in partnership. You know, we want to get a solution with the EU. If you go back and look at what the EU said in January, where they, were, they recognised there were some issues, VAT on second-hand cars, pets, and other things like that, we've still got a situation where they've not given us category one on pets, despite the fact, you know, we've got the best regime for animal um, protection probably in the, in the world, certainly in Europe, and we haven't had rabies since 1921, so there's no risk of this, and yet they, for some reason, still haven't granted it. They accepted that we need to move quickly to get these solutions. And yet, while they talk about flexibility, they talk about pragmatism, actually, we've not, we've not until today, where we've seen a bit, we've not really seen it in practice. And that's why back in March, we took unilateral action, which I know was controversial at the time, but we took that action because we were being made, it was made very clear to us by the business community that if we didn't take the unilateral action at that point in that week, we would have had empty shelves in Northern Ireland. If we had empty shelves again, we would maybe have seen violence. We certainly would have seen the protocol being questioned in its integrity. Um, and we were clear with the EU about that. And they said that what we did and what we took you know, attraction, they didn't necessarily disagree with, but why couldn't we do it by agreement? Well, to do it by agreement, they need to come to the table and agree things. So my point would be, we, as I say, we put over some really, I think, practical solutions that they should be engaging with us on, and they need to actually engage with them on, on this. Um, rather than talking about it. Okay, um, I'm going to ask uh, two questions here. Um, you uh, you talked about uh, there, there's still people within Northern Ireland that are asking for the the protocol to be abolished. Uh, number one, can that happen? You know, is there a possibility for that? And uh, number two, um, in Northern uh, in a number of years, the Northern Ireland Assembly will be subject to a straight majority vote on the protocol, and rather a cross community vote, as would normally be the case for contentious issues in the Assembly. Um, it has been agreed that this will be a straight uh, majority vote. Um, what's the purpose of this vote for, for the Northern Ireland Assembly? Do they have a power to vote against the Northern Ireland Protocol? Um, and it kind of fits with the first question that I ask. Can the Northern Ireland Protocol be removed? Um, well, in legality terms, yes, it can, in the sense of if, yes, they can vote against it, if 2024, that consent mechanism um, decides the protocol is gone, it's gone, it, 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 that's it, it has to go. And this is one of the points I've made to the EU myself, Marisha Rich, and I, I know others have, but I made more widely, is this is why it's ultimately the interest of the EU to be pragmatic and flexible. It's why I'm surprised they've struggled to do that so far, because if they don't, the, the protocol isn't going to survive if it doesn't have the consent of the whole community of Northern Ireland. It's no good having even one part of it. And, you know, the Belfast Good Friday Group is about consent of all the communities. And even um, the most uh, strong feeling nationalists in Northern Ireland, when you talk to them, have issues with the protocol. They say they might not want to scrap it in the way some hardline loyalists might, but they still have issues with it. So nobody that I've come across yet has particularly said to me that the protocol is fine, leave it as it is. Everybody wants to see something um, change about it. So it could, uh, through Northern Ireland uh, Assembly, it could go, and I think the EU needs to be alert to that. And that's why they should engage with us, because 
It is a legal agreement. It is a framework, you know, to, to deal with a very complicated, unique circumstances situation of Northern Ireland. Um, if it works in a flexible, pragmatic way, then it can work, because then it can ensure that the goods that are going into the single market are properly dealt with, but the goods that are staying in the UK don't have the kind of rigmarole that means that we see rising prices, companies stopping supply, or consumers not, and businesses not getting access to products they need. And if you get that right and everything flows correctly, not only is the EU protected, Bear in mind, if you fully implement the protocol the way they're talking about, 20% of all the EU's border checks would be within the UK, which is a crazy situation. It's just an unthinkable situation, um, as some people are arguing. But also, as I say, you then get into this world where you have a protocol that works, that the confidence of the EU can be there for it, comes to people in Northern Ireland can be there, and Northern Ireland has this very unique trading position in the world that gives it massive, massive economic opportunities as we go forward. I think you're on mute, Claire. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, let's talk about those potential opportunities of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Northern Ireland has access to, to potentially two markets, the UK and the EU. Do, um, John is asking, and potentially any opportunities with the US, um, does that create a divergence, um, as you had talked earlier, between Northern Ireland and the GB with these new other new opportunities? Uh, no, I think it's, it's actually complimentary. I can't just say to anybody watching, the way my system works, I'm relying on Claire telling me all the questions. I can't see the chat room or the question room or any of, any of that. All I can see at the moment is, uh, is, uh, is, is Claire. So, uh, yeah, look, I think, I think, no, because if, the, if we get the protocol working in a really flexible, pragmatic, well, the way we envisaged it, when we published our command paper in the summer of 2020, uh, which was warmly and positively received by the EU as well, as it happens, um, then, as I say, Northern Ireland's got its very unique position. It only has that because it's part of the United Kingdom, and it can then trade fully and fluidly as an integral part of the UK and the UK internal market. So it's integrally part of it. And because it's part of the UK, it has that opportunity through our huge network of the Foreign Office, our embassies, Department of International Trade, to go out globally and benefit not just from the uh, trade deals we do as the UK, but just the, the general work that our missions and our trades the teams are doing and our embassies are doing around the world. I think there's a particular opportunity in the US because there's obviously a long history, a tradition and an affinity between the island of Ireland and Northern Ireland and the US. And there's a lot of US companies already investing in Northern Ireland, particularly in high tech areas of engineering, manufacturing, space and cyber particularly. And the way that, and I think you touched on this in your opening remarks um, at the beginning of the hour, Claire, the way that I think is particularly powerful in Northern Ireland, the way that the public sector, the academic sector, and the private sector come together on some of these high tech areas, why Queen's has just been awarded second year running, most entrepreneurial university in the UK, is quite special and phenomenal. So I think actually quite the opposite. I mean, because it's part of the UK, um, Northern Ireland's opportunities just become abundant. Okay, so I suppose what I'm hearing here is that Northern Ireland is not a basket case, and certainly in the year of the centenary of Northern Ireland, um, how do we build on the opportunities that we have realised over the last uh, number of 20 years? And I'm, I'm particularly mindful um, of this in the context of calls potentially for a United Ireland. You know, what's your view on that? How, how do we ensure that, um, or how do we move forward in, in terms of the constitutional issues and in, in progressing Northern Ireland within its context on the island of Ireland, but also as part of the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom? Kingdom. Sure, you'll appreciate, um, Claire, that I have uh, certain duties around uh, those issues. I think it's interesting, recently there was uh, some data that showed there's only about 30% support at the moment for the United Ireland anyway. So but what I pick up, and I've been talking to people in civic society, <clears throat> certainly in the business community, but in civic society more widely, is what most people want, is actually what the T-shirt, we, where we do agree with the T-shirt in terms of is shared island unit approach is that there are two administrations, there's the UK and the Irish government working on the island of Ireland, we share the island and, and being open and, and um, in partnership together on that I think is a really positive thing, both in terms of infrastructure more widely um, and academia and research and we want to do that um, and we are, you know, we're good friends with the Irish and want to build and develop on that for the benefit of everybody on the island of Ireland. Um, but I think what most people I find, when, I'm, when you talk to people in Northern Ireland, what they really want is they want the executive and their assembly and their government in the UK government to be focused on the issues that affect people every day. You know, most people in Northern Ireland do not spend their day 
discussing the constitutional background or even arguably on a day-to-day -day basis the protocol. What they're focused on is their children getting a good education. And there's much more we need to do on that, particularly to take forward integrated education in the way that was foreseen at the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, we've got a good healthcare system and there's work to do there. Um, I'll be investing in our infrastructure, whether it's broadband or genuine hard infrastructure, roads and rail, and there is work to do there. So people have got job opportunities for the future and things that they can see developing. And that's why I think they want to see people focus. And you can see that when the political parties are focused on those things, you can see the response in a positive way that they get. And I think the public, and I'd say what I've picked up particularly this year, um, want to see their politicians not just focused on the same old um, political footballs that they tend to play with, whether it's the cultural package around languages, whether it's um, we recently big debates about this debates about abortion, or whether it's the constitution of future, what they want to see people focus on is getting us out of the pandemic in a healthy way and building the economy of the future. And I think that's where we our focus needs to be as politicians for and, and as government for, for the people of Northern Ireland. Yeah, sure. And um, I, I suppose I, I, I entirely agree with that. But all those things that you talk about, we will either do that within the context of uh, delivering those services uh, within a United King Kingdom, or we'll do it within uh, the context of, uh, of the United Ireland. So I do think the constitutional question is the fundamental basis of our politics here is an important one. And indeed, the Good Friday Agreement does encourage us to brace, embrace that context. Um, but you've talked about um, other issues, and, and you very specifically mentioned integrated education. Um, what do you think um, about the delivery of the Northern Ireland Assembly in terms of actually doing its job in the Northern Ireland Executive about moving from that period of transitioning our political institutions to a period of transformation and good governance and actually delivering for the people of Northern Ireland? Yeah, I, no, I agree with you. You're absolutely right. That is exactly what the Good Friday Allies and we should, people should feel free um, and should be having that discussion debate. I've got no issue with that. As I say, I, I, my, what, I, what I think is also is we've got to create that space because if you take the media coverage, it's often around a couple of these key issues as, you know, we've just spent half an hour quite understandably in the current climate talking about the protocol. And actually it's creating the space to then be able to talk about investment in particular industries and, and academia or, or research and development, et cetera. And that's, that's on all of us to do that. But I think that you're, you're, you're also, um, I think, absolutely uh, correct that as we, as we look forward, um, we've got to make sure that we are looking at what are the areas that people are focused on, interested in, uh, what do they want to see people delivering on. And I think the exec has come back in after three years of not sitting at all. And I think the people in Northern Ireland were beyond angry about that at the end. And one of the things I picked up over the last month or so was, you know, I, I think there'll be no tolerance from the public of Northern Ireland for uh, politicians ending that institution or being seen to play games with that institution, I think they want to see it up and running and focused on those issues. That for the, you know, they've been back up for 18 months or so now. And to be fair to the executive, as I said, they, they were only a couple of weeks into formation when the pandemic came upon them. So they've not really had time to get into the kind of discussions and debate that a developed authority would normally be doing on those wider societal issues, whether it's health or education. So I think we've got to let them get through the pandemic and then look at how they deliver that, which in reality now is probably going to be more than anything after the next election next year, although we would all like to see some signs of that in the, in the second half of this year, uh, but we'll be pretty quickly into election mode. And I do think there is a lot more to do. When you consider something like only 7% of the population of Northern Ireland are in integrated schools, so you still will regularly be uh, talking to people um, who are beyond school age and you find out that the first time as a Protestant they met a Catholic or as a Catholic they met a Protestant was when they went to university or went to work. That is not going to long term see us delivering proper reconciliation and integration across Northern Ireland society. So I think we do need to look at how working together we can drive an agenda like that much, much, much more to deliver for the long term future. And indeed, in terms of efficiency of delivering good outcomes for people, by ensuring that money is being spent efficiently and effectively to get the best possible education for those children. Okay, um, another question from the floor um, in relation to the Irish language and um, uh, other uh, devolved issues in Northern Ireland. You have suggested that you may uh, take decisions on those if the Northern Ireland Executive and the Assembly cannot agree to do that. Um, is that something that they're only keen to take forward and does that mean devolution isn't able to work um, because they can't take hard decisions? 
Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say something I'm keen to say forward. I'd say quite the opposite. I really don't want to have to say those things forward. Um, I would like to see the Northern Ireland executive deliver on all those issues. I also would just say, even on the language point, it's actually a cultural package, of course. Um, it's a very balanced cultural package, but one that is one that was agreed by the parties themselves as part of the new decade, new approach um, agreement. What I would, the point with that thing is that it was agreed by the parties, it was agreed to be delivered in this mandate, and we as UK government are a co-guarantor of that. So I think we do have a duty to ensure that that is delivered, not least of all if it is also about inherently and intrinsically uh, keeping the stability of Storm and keeping it up and running. But we have a duty as a co-signatory and a co-guarantor of that agreement to do our bit to deliver on it. <clears throat> Ultimately, we are the UK government, and we do therefore, you know, we govern for the whole of the United Kingdom. So there are going to be times where, quite rightly, I would argue, uh, we can, uh, we should be able to legislate, do things for the best interests of, um, and in the benefit of residents of any part of the UK. That's what the UK government is there for. That's what why the UK Internal Market Bill we've taken powers to be able to uh, do some direct spending, to be able to allocate money directly to organisations and individuals and organisations um, in the developed areas. But also, if you take an area like uh, one of the other areas that gets attention around devolution, is abortion. Um, and at the moment, we have a situation, and actually, I'll make a similar, I'll come back to language as well in a second, but on abortion, we have a situation where women in Northern Ireland are not able to get the access to the same quality healthcare as women in the rest of the UK. That can't be right, it can't continue, and I'm not prepared to see and hear a story, another harrowing story, of a woman going through the most disgusting and disgraceful experience, genuinely harrowing experience over trying to get proper care when in need of an abortion because it's not available in Northern Ireland because it's not allowed to be get got through the political process. Morally, that isn't right. And also, as a UK government looking after the Union in the United Kingdom, it's wrong that women in Northern Ireland get secondary quality health care to women elsewhere in the UK. So there is a good positive union argument to it. But ultimately, I think we have a duty to do what's right for women. And we also have a legal duty um, under CEDA, under some international agreements as well, and parliamentary rules. Okay. Similarly, I mean, I wouldn't ever put language, obviously, in the same boat um, as women's rights and, and access to healthcare. But there's also a point about the cultural package, which I think has sometimes been missed. Two points. One is that it is a balanced package. There's Ulster Scots Commissioner and there's Irish Language Commissioner, and then there's a commissioner that sits across everything. So it's a very balanced package that the parties carefully negotiated and agreed. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, of course, we have languages and dialects across the UK. We have the Gaelic in Scotland, we have Welsh language in Wales that William Hague, a Conservative minister, took forward many years ago. I, as a minister, um, did a deal to agree funding for Cornwall to have the Cornish language developed. Um, from Norfolk, we have our own dialects occasionally as well. So, you know, that's how we embrace and celebrate across the UK. And there's no reason we shouldn't do that in Northern Ireland to support people's rights uh, where they have it to, uh, to enjoy and learn from it. But we should also be cognizant of the fact that I think, as a matter of fact, we have more people who speak Mandarin and Polish than we do Irish and Ulster Scots in Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, taking more questions from the audience, and you talked about um, being a co-guarantor of Good Friday Agreement alongside the Irish government. So from Etienne is asking, how important is prior consultation with the Irish government before making key decisions in managing the issues ahead? Uh, we, we do work with the Irish government. I mean, obviously, sometimes you've got to remember there are things that are not part of the strand that's east-west in terms of Irish-UK government. For example, a good example of this is issues around leaving the EU um, and uh, the protocol. We do talk to the Irish government. I've got, I have a, I love the, I've got a very good relationship with Simon Coveney. We talk to the teacher. I speak to the teacher, as do colleagues of mine and other ministers. In fact, we had the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference just last week, which was a really positive uh, discussion. But of course, the protocol is between the UK and the EU. And obviously, there are also issues in Northern Ireland that are strand one. They are Northern Ireland internal issues that rightly should be for the executive or for the UK government, which is the government of, of Northern Ireland. Um, so I think sometimes people blur the lines around where things are in partnership, but we do always try to work in partnership as we are on trying to find a solution for legacy. We want to work with the Irish government on that. Uh, we got an agreement last week. We're going to work together on that. That work is starting this week. 
that's a really positive thing and a, and a sign that we can on those really difficult, complicated, sensitive issues work together, hopefully in a positive way. Okay, um, a question from Anthony Soares. Does uh, the Secretary of State welcome the EU's decision to waive the need for a green card for Northern Ireland drivers in the Republic of Ireland, which is particularly important for cross-border workers? And can we build on these moves in terms of uh, moving forward and, and finding solutions? Uh, yes, and good afternoon, Anthony. Anthony, I know each other well from a number of Zoom meetings over the last year and a half. But yes, absolutely. And I think what is really positive from today's uh, decision by the EU is that they have shown some flexibility. And I think it does show that, you know, there is an ability to work together to get some pragmatic solutions. There's, but this is just a start. Uh, there's a lot more things we need to resolve. We want to do that working with the EU, but these things do need to be resolved. But I think it is a, it's a good signal. And, and I'm always an optimist, so I'm hopeful that we will be able to uh, work together to resolve these things sooner rather than later. Great. Um, Elliot Murphy is asking, what are your thoughts regarding common travel area citizens helping the UK overcome skill shortages um, who will effectively bypass the government's skilled worker visa lists? Uh, well, we, I, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of common travel area. I think uh, if you look back even over COVID, actually, the Irish government actually didn't protect the, the common travel area, actually. Uh, obviously, some of the restrictions they put in around COVID meant that they had to step away from parts of the common travel area. We didn't. We kept the common travel area properly protected from our side all the way through, which uh, very generously the Thomas Steve himself has, has recognised and commented on. Um, and we will continue to protect the CTA. It's an important part of the British Isles, our two islands, the way we work together. And it's something that's a benefit to both of our economies. Okay, Brian Doggerty, MBE, and we've already explored this a little bit, but he says, can you expand on the potential positives of the broader of the broader Brexit arrangements? For instance, are Belfast and Foy ports in line for free port status? <laughs> and good afternoon to Brian as well. Yes, look, the, um, we will we are looking to uh, have a, a at least for one free port in Northern Ireland. I think it, it's another example of some of the things we can do outside of the EU that we couldn't have couldn't do when we were in the EU, that can be a benefit to Northern Ireland. And again, if we get the, if, and, it, and I appreciate it's an if, because there's work to do, and people will be um, uh, suspicious or um, um, sceptical about the ability to do this because of the experience of the last six months. But as I say, I am an optimist, and I think we will be able to ultimately resolve the issues with the protocol. We've been very clear we want to do with the EU, but we don't take anything off the table because we are going to do what's right for people in Northern Ireland. If you put together a protocol that's flexible, pragmatic, and works the way it was envisaged, and you add free ports to the mix, and you add the city and growth deals to the mix, and you add £400 million of new deal money that I've got to invest um, in Northern Ireland for opportunities and economic growth, and then the Peace Plus money, which is now, you know, all together, we, we're putting in a road just over and around half a billion, on top of everything else. There are huge opportunities in Northern Ireland, and I think we can look forward to a, a really exciting few years ahead. The job for me and all of us um, who have roles and responsibility across Northern Ireland and for Northern Ireland is to make sure that we grasp those opportunities and we deliver on them. And the proof of that will be in the pudding in the next 12 and 18 months. Okay, thank you. And Liz McManus, um, can you tell us about, um, about what outcome you're looking for from the multi-party talks on legacy? How is that out outcome likely to differ from the legacy uh, proposal in Stormont House Agreement? Uh, well, the big thing is it's, it's got to be something that's deliverable. Stormont House was 2014. Uh, we're seven years on and it's not been delivered on. Well, there's reasons for that. Uh, not all the parties actually did agree with Stormont House at the time, which is often a point that's made. Um, there was a consultation the UK government did a couple of years ago on Stormont House that brought up some quite um, uh, genuine and serious concerns with parts of it. And other things have happened. We've seen cases coming through the system. We've had Operation Canova, which is a big operation in terms of looking into some of the issues um, from, from legacy in the past. And in that seven years, all of those things, there are learnings that we've got to take forward. So I think we need to learn from that. But the principles of Stormont House, of so information recovery in a genuine sense, truth and reconciliation, a genuine reconciliation. I think for me, as I said earlier on, I, I won't go into detail again, but uh, uh, integrated education is absolutely key to community reconciliation in the long run. Um, and oral histories, all of those things I think are a hugely important part of it. What we've got to really explore is what is getting in the way at the moment of delivering on these things. Uh, there are certain clear things that have been preventing these. There's some issues with Stormont House. 
Uh, the criminal justice system arguably is preventing people from getting uh, closure and an outcome and the community has been able to move forward. We're seeing the lack of ability to prosecute, some cases recently have highlighted that, and some dreadful cases like the Bala Murphy um, coroner's report, which highlighted it should never take 50 years for people to get information and to know the truth of what happened. We've got to have better than that. And I'm determined that when we come out of this, we come out of it with something that we can uh, see being delivered pretty much immediately. We want to legislate quickly, get it up and running, and get that information, get to the truth, and be able to start allowing Northern Ireland to move forward in a way it's just not been able to do previously because this is something that's been holding up. And as I say, we, we should never again be in a situation where fans are waiting 50 years or anything like that to get information. Um, that, that isn't a system that's working for anybody. Thank you. And maybe a final question uh, from Kieran Reid, who is writing from the Western Balkans. Um, he says that he has long held the view that some young people in bad or relatively deprived parts of Northern Ireland, just like riot in, in, in the summer, like they, they, they like the excitement and are manipulated by those with an interest in destabilisation. But as common in England and much of Europe, many people have taken progress for granted about how much help achieved. Um, so what can be done now to reinforce the importance of peace and to really build on the progress that has been made over the, tw the last 23 years since the Good Friday Agreement? Yeah, no, I think it makes a very, very insightful and important point there. There was some, there was some writing and some um, columns and uh, commentary pieces around the violence we saw that kind of made the point that there was uh, some perception from some people um, that some of the violence we saw, you know, 13-year-old kids out there throwing petrol bombs were not doing it because they had an in intricate understanding of the uh, rules of origin of the Northern Ireland Protocol and therefore being egged on by adults and that kind of excitement can drive things. And as I said, it was a very multifaceted situation. But I do think, and, I, and therefore, I, that, that's what some commentators were writing without me getting into too much of the detail of, of that right here and now, because that would be another hour of session. But I think here's the underlying point is right. There are working class communities in Northern Ireland, both Protestant and Catholic communities, you know, whether you're looking at areas in Belfast or Derry, London, Derry and elsewhere, that have not benefited from economic prosperity and growth in the last couple of decades. And one of the things I'm very keen to do, when we talk about levelling up as, and building back better here in the UK, and I know that's what the US are looking to do, we want to make sure everybody benefits from that, whether it's through social enterprise or direct investment that we can now do. Whether I want to make sure that those people who haven't seen the benefit in the past don't just hear us talk about levelling up and building that better, but can actually see what it means, see investment in their community, job opportunities, better education, whatever it happens to be, working with people in their communities is something I'm very keen to do so we can actually deliver for them. So it comes back to the opening point I think you may care quite widely, and I'll reinforce for a second time here. Long-term peace in Northern Ireland is intrinsically and inherently knitted into long-term prosperity. And we need to deliver that widely for the whole community of Northern Ireland. Yep, absolutely. I agree. Um, political stability in Northern Ireland should lead to good governance, which should be about addressing the issue, all those issues that you have talked about. I was Minister absolutely. of Justice. Uh, I, I was Minister of Justice when we put forward the Paramilitaries Action Plan, and it was never going to work in the absence of, pro of a program for government which sought to build up those communities so that they couldn't be exploited by those elements within society. So I really do think now to move Northern Ireland forward, it has to be about good governance and it has to be about delivery of public services to everyone within it. So I think on that positive note, Secretary of State, um, I it, just want to thank you for your contribution um, uh, this evening. I think it's been a really interesting conversation. It's uh, we've covered an awful lot of topics. There's been some great questions um, from, from both sides of the Atlantic. I'm sure you will agree. Um, and just to give my thanks for, for being part of this uh, conference over the past number of days, um, it's been very enlightening for me. And I think it's good for the world to, to, to see that Northern Ireland is a progressive place and that we can take it forward if we all uh, work together to the best interests of all within it. So thank you, Secretary of State, and thank you everyone else for joining the discussion this evening.